This is also a trick that I've used to, ah! land, to land interviews with people <laughs> and to reach publicists. Yes. So, and there it you works. go, world. Now you know. It works. <laughs> yeah. You want the American dream. You want the life, the liberty, the happiness. But until you get there, until you achieve your goals and make your dreams come true, you know what you have. You have the journey, the hustle, the climb. I'm Kelsey Humphreys, and this is The Pursuit where I interview the best of the best in person on their home turf about how they got started, how they got to where they are today, and what you can learn from them about success. Prepare to be inspired, equipped, motivated, encouraged, and have a lot of fun. Kelsey, are you ready? I'm ready. Thank you for joining me for another episode of The Pursuit. This episode was shot in Marina Del Rey in the most amazing condo in the middle of this marina with boats that cost, I don't know, I don't even know. I don't even know, you guys. Just bajillions? Is that, can we say bajillions? Uh, and it was just so beautiful and so awesome and so is Fawn Weaver. I think you guys will love her. This episode with Fawn Weaver was kind of a surprise for me because I was actually reaching out to her publicist about a few different people and her publicist recommended Fawn to me. And I hadn't previously heard of the Happy Wives Club, which you'll learn about when you watch the interview here in a second. But then I just fell in love with Fawn and when I met her for the very first time, instead of a handshake, she went in for the hug. So I was like, oh, we're gonna be just fine. <laughs> we're gonna be just fine. And she was amazing. I think that she is gonna go on to have her own show and build some sort of empire because you'll see she's a natural on camera. She is so warm, so fun. She's so generous with her knowledge. And there's many layers to Fawn, which I think you'll find interesting. I went there to talk about her book and her online community and we ended up talking about so much more. And she also has some great insights for entrepreneurs who are married to non-entrepreneurs or non-entrepreneurs who are married to entrepreneurs. I think you'll really enjoy this episode from Marina Del Rey, California with Fawn Weaver. Fawn Weaver is the founder of the Happy Wives Club and is not only a USA Today and New York Times bestselling author, but a proud wife and role model to all women in love or those who believe in true love. She just released her newest book, The Argument Free Marriage, 28 Days to Creating the Marriage You've Always Wanted with the Spouse You Already Have via Nelson Books. And she was also just recently one of this year's TED Talks. And she spoke on the argument-free marriage and how Oprah, Barbara Walters, and Rosie O'Donnell all gave us the best marriage advice without even knowing it. When she's not doing all of that, holy cow, she is also an investor in real estate and technology and lifestyle brands and operates as the chief strategy officer in the companies in which she invests. Fawn, thank you so much for letting us come today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We are here in gorgeous Marina Del Rey, <laughs> California. Looking over the ocean, yeah. I kind of just want to jump on one of these yachts and just, <laughs> let's just go on vacation. What do you think? I say let's do it. I need one. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Um, all right, so I want to dive into so many things, but yeah. let's start with your um, new book. Yes. And and your community, your Happy Wives Club, is almost to one million yes, it um, is. members. Yeah. So let's talk about how that journey started and how you grew such a large community. Sure. Well, the Happy Wives Club grew mainly because I was a happy wife and I didn't see myself represented in media. Even even now, you very rarely see it. At the time, this was about five years ago, the number one show was Desperate Housewives. The Real Housewives of everywhere were popping up. I think Atlanta had just come on board and it's like, good Lord, these women do not represent the wives that I know. My girlfriends, we have awesome husbands. We really enjoy being married. And at the time, I was the general manager of a hotel and I had a really bad day. And, and that happens sometimes, <laughs> right? And it was a tough day for me. And I did what I would always do in a situation like that. I called my husband. So I only had a small amount of time. And so I said, I, I need you. And as we're walking along the, this boardwalk getting frozen yogurt, I start telling him the challenge I was having. Someone lied to me and it was a really big deal in the company and I was disappointed and I wanted to get that out. So we're walking along and I don't know why to this day and I don't know what the book was, but we were walking by Barnes and Noble and we there's 
just the glass case and I look and there's some book that's knocking marriage because you know there's a lot of those mm-hmm. and just makes it seem like the old ball and chain and it's so difficult and it's so mm-hmm. this and it's so that and I look at my husband this person who is helping me walk through this day helping to call me helping me to just feel better and lift me up and then I look at this and I look back at my husband and I literally just went on a rant <laughs> and you know, which we all do oh yeah. <laughs> and you know how when you're really frustrated about one thing but you're just like it's all directed towards something else and I said what is it about just the media? What is it about books? Why do they make it seem like marriage is so hard? Mm-hmm. Why can they not just say, you know what? There are some really good guys out there. There are some really wonderful husbands. They don't all cheat, and all the wives don't nag yeah. and manipulate. Mm-hmm. How about we see that? And so poor guy, he's just like, where did this come from? <laughs> we <laughs> yeah. were talking about your staff. Right. And But as we continued walking, and I just kept thinking more and more about it, I said, you know what? I'm going to start a club. I'm going to start a club for women like me who have awesome husbands, who love being married, who do not see themselves portrayed in anything that we Mm -hmm. see on media, and I'm going to invite other people like me. And so we kept walking, and I was like, I know. I'm going to call it the Happy Wives Club. It's a corny name, but it said how I feel. Yeah. I love being married, and I wanted to see more women like me Mm -hmm. in the media. Have I? Still don't, Mm -hmm. but it was at least a hope. And so I said, let's shine a a spotlight on everything that's great about marriage, all that's positive about marriage, and let's shine a spotlight on people that actually like being married and actually like their spouses. And so that's what I did. And I invited my five closest girlfriends that I knew adore their hubbies. And I, I sent an email to them and said, hey, I just built this you know, website in 30 minutes, however long. <laughs> and awesome. it was super simple. It just said, this is who we are. Join the club if you love being married, if your husband rocks, and if everything that you see right now in the media does not represent you. Mm-hmm. And so I sent it out to five women that all live within a 20 mile radius of here. And within four weeks, we were in 22 countries. So then I knew, hmm, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. What do you, how and did that, email, how did, oh, an email, an okay. email. This is before, All like, right. Facebook was huge. It Facebook is, I mean, now you can just send something out on your Facebook and it'll go to 22 countries. Right. But you're talking about people that were emailing it to a girlfriend and then emailing it to wow, another girlfriend and then emailing awesome. it to another girlfriend. So within four weeks, we were in 22 countries and I thought, hmm, this was needed. Yeah. And so I continue doing it, even though I'm, you know, juggling GM duties mm-hmm. and still building this club. And it's just continued to build. And then once, of course, social media came on board, it, it was easy to go into 110 countries. And there's a lot of people, I think, watching and they have, uh, they're building a community around something positive mm-hmm. and they would love news coverage. So talk about how you pitched that at the beginning. Well, my first company when I was 18 was a PR company. So it was then, yeah. (laughs) So I had a little bit, or that's my my company. Oh, awesome. So I started my first company when I was 18. So I've been building companies since then. And so you had that PR background. Mm -hmm. I had the PR background. So you knew how to pitch to these people. So what, what would you tell the people who want to do that? What should they do? Do your homework. And so for most people, they like to go onto these free PR sites and send out over the the news wire, right? Mm -hmm. No Mm -hmm. one pays attention to that. So (laughs) I uploaded it to that because you do need that just for a format. And then I did my research over at Boston Globe, the LA Times, the New York Times, to see who wrote on the topic of marriage. And then I would figure out their email by way of deduction. No news outlet is going to like this. (laughs) But... It it is. If you look hard enough, you will find someone within the organization that has an email address that's been posted live somewhere. So it's like, you know, F Weaver at whatever. And so then I just did that. This is also a trick that I've used to land land interviews with people (laughs) and to reach publicists. Yes. And there it you works. go, world. Now you know. It works, <laughs> yeah, right? It really does. You it have really to does. do the homework. Yeah. But you can absolutely find people that way. Awesome. So let's talk about your entrepreneurial background. Um, now, tell us a little bit, explain like you did to me off camera what you do yeah. now. Right now, I invest in companies. So I invest in lifestyle brands, real estate, and technology companies. And so if there's something that has potential or something that's already existing that I can invest in, then I go in as the chief strategy officer to either turn the company around or to take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. But I go in as a silent partner. So if I were to walk into a, a location that I'm investing in, so whatever the business is, I'm generally going to go in and help 
at the front desk or the receptionist <laughs> or the so no one really knows. They just know there's this woman that keeps coming in to help us. That's we know funny. she's a part of the company, but we don't quite know what. Hmm. And I almost never, I never say it unless you flat out ask me the question, "Are you an owner?" You'll never know. Interesting. Yeah. It's like undercover boss kind of. Kind of is, but I really do go to support. I never go to figure out what they're doing wrong. I always go to figure out what could we from the executive side be doing better. So what are the biggest mi mistakes you see these companies making? Sticking to the same thing they've always done. Mm. One of the biggest mistakes is if you ever say these words, this is the way we've always done it, mm -hmm. you are setting yourself up for failure mm. immediately. Those words. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> this is the way we've always done it. Eight words. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Eight wow. words to failure. So how do you get them past that hump of being stuck in a rut? It's hard. It's really, really hard. And I am a pretty strong person. And so I just push. Mm. I push because either you are going to hold on to that sinking ship and go down with it, or you're going to decide to pivot before you hit the iceberg. Mm. And so it's, I, you know, I, I use the example of Blockbuster and Redbox, for instance, that Blockbuster had the name value, right? Right. When Redbox started popping up at grocery stores, yeah. they should have said, okay, this is where we're going. We've got the name recognition. Let's just kill them. Apple and Google do it all the time. Right, they do. <laughs> they definitely Blockbuster do. said, this is the way we've yeah. always done it. Now, where's, where is the Blockbuster? Yeah. And that's unfortunate because they could have killed Redbox out of the gate. And so I usually do use that example with owners when they say, this is the way we've always done it. I look at them and go, please don't be a blockbuster. I don't want to be a part of a blockbuster. So if that's where we're headed, let's let's not. So do you pull your investment at that point if a company won't pivot? You don't have a choice but to pivot if I'm investing. So oh, okay. so we've, we've already tested that you're Got willing it. to make some changes. Yeah. Maybe not all of them, but you're willing to make some changes if I'm putting money in. Okay, wow, that's very interesting. Now, you mentioned that you and your husband are both very strong people, and it cannot, it's not always easy to be married to an entrepreneur like yourself. Yeah. So how have you seen you know, entrepreneurial traits and marriage? What can entrepreneurs out there and the spouses of entrepreneurs do in their marriages? What do you think? This is what I love about marriage, and I tell, I tell married people this all the time. When you are married, you have a built-in advantage for success. It's built in because you can go twice as fast. You can climb twice as high. It's almost like if you run, have you ever run a marathon? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> My, no. Nope. That's just a negative. It's not it. All right. No. <laughs> okay. Well, it is, I mean, the, I ran a marathon. Mm -hmm. I may do another. I like half marathons, but I ran one marathon. And it was a tough marathon for me. I, I felt like I had a blister from mile one. So then a mile, imagine going the other 25.2 miles, right? See why I don't really want to <laughs> Oh, uh, so I did, the, I did the marathon. I got to the end. But this is what I found out years later is that I got my medal and I, you know, had that medal hanging around a door for years. There are so many people with marathon medals that did not actually run the full race. You can team up with someone and do a relay. Mm -hmm. You run 13.1 miles. They run the other 13.1 miles. Marriage, when it's working as it should, is mm. that relay. There are times when I have so much going on, like I have this book going on, I have a company that's underperforming in another state, so I yeah. am traveling wow. back and forth constantly, and, and my next week involves here, Los Angeles, New York, Toronto, back to, to the other state where the investment is. That's hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> But a part of why I can do it is that when I feel as though I can't take any more, my husband will come alongside of me and say, what can I do? Hmm. And I'm the exact same way. Yeah. And so when you look at marriage as this is a partnership, it is the best partnership we have in our lifetime, it's a relay. When I've got too much going on, babe, help me with this. Mm -hmm. So right now, he's he's been helping me with this book. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it absolutely is. Have you had any pushback from people who uh, have children because you guys don't have children? Absolutely. But the reality is, is and people always m mention that, but we don't have children not because we don't want children. And the divorce rate is maybe three times higher when there's inf infertility involved. Not, it's not for a lack of trying. Gotcha. And it's not for a lack of involving doctors either. Yeah. And so for most most couples that go through this, mm -hmm. a huge portion of them don't make it out. It. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I appreciate you being so candid about that and sharing that. And so let's talk about your book. Well, first of all, how did you manage and foster that community? And then were you approached about the book deal or did you have the book idea? How did that all happen? I'm a writer. This is what I've always done from the time I was young. It's very cathartic for me. Mm -hmm. And so I never wanted to publish a book. So what I would do is as I was learning things, I would write it. And that's just kind of how I kept things. And I would write these manuscripts <laughs> and I would leave them on my laptop. And then if I had a girlfriend that called me and said, I'm having this challenge, I'd go, hold on, I wrote something about it. And I'd go oh. find a chapter or two chapters or if I had a whole book on it, and I would send it to them. Hmm. And when my little sister, well, I have four, but when one of my little sisters got married, she, I wanted to give her something special. And so I asked Keith, my husband, if we could put together our top 10 list of things that we do to keep a peaceful marriage. And we would always had a really peaceful, wonderful marriage. We always communicated really well. We're two incredibly strong-willed people, but we communicated really well. And I said, let's, let's put this together for her. And as we were working on it, we realized there were 25 different things that we did that we didn't even realize that we had done. So putting boundaries in places, just different things that as we wrote it out for her, we're like, wait a minute. Our argument-free marriage is not a result of us just being two similar people, because we are quite different. Our argument-free marriage is a result of these 25 things. Hmm. And so we presented it to her and her husband for a wedding gift. And we basically turned it into a journal and hmm. just took different stories from our own marriage and applied it to each principle so that they could see how that looked. And once I did that, then other people started asking, well, can we have yeah, a copy it. of that? Right. Yeah. And so that's how this came about. And finally, one of my girlfriends said, you have got to publish this. I get that you've been doing this for a long time and you've got like 10 manuscripts and you don't ever want to publish, but there are so many marriages falling by the wayside. It would actually be a disservice not to publish this one. Mm. So I sent it to an agent and he said, because you know, I'm a nobody <laughs> and agents are busy. Yeah. And so he sent me an email back. I was referred to him by someone. He sent me an email back. And he says, okay, great. I'll get back to you in 30 days. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, hey, at least he responded, right? Yeah, true, true, And true. he only responded because one of his clients had reached out to him. Okay. But at least he responded. And almost 30 days to the day, I get an email from him saying, can we talk? And we got on the phone, and he said, so I read this. Do you want to be an author for a living? And I said, I, I, I don't. Oh. I write because I love to write. If writing ever felt like work to me, I would stop. Hmm. And he said, well, if you let me represent you, I will assure you that it will not feel like work to you. That will be my job. You just write. And so I signed with him. So let's go back. You the, the email starts spreading, and this is before social media. Yeah. So what did you do at that point to keep cultivating the growth and keep the conversation going when you had a full-time job, a very demanding one? It was really difficult. It was really difficult. And I would run over to the hotel, which, thank goodness, it was three minutes from the house. <laughs> yeah. I run over to the hotel and I do my thing there, but the media caught wind of it. And by the media caught wind of it, I mean, I cultivated the media because I saw this and thought there, there's something mm. here. There's something special here and the world needs to know this exists. And social media was around. It just wasn't relied on like we do now. Mm -hmm. Everyone wasn't checking on Facebook yeah. all the time. And so that's what I did. And so I'd be at the hotel and then I go, okay guys, I have to go Go, I'll be right back. And then I'd go run and do like an interview at my house with Channel 7 News. Oh, and okay. then I'd run back. It got to be really, really tough. Mm -hmm. And I was already transitioning out to focus full time on our various investments. And after about a year, I did. And that gave me a little bit more time to continue cultivating the community. And social media began to build. So that's where mm -hmm. I really began connecting with people is through social media. So our Facebook page, I think 900,000 mm -hmm. or something like that, that's where I really began talking to the women. You know what? Let's jump back because you also just spoke at TED, yes. which is like, oh, like it's like <laughs> Mecca for speakers and yeah. for ideas. Yeah. So how did that come about? It's, you know, it's funny. I, my little sister, she calls it curated happenstance because she watched the way things in my mm -hmm. life would unfold. And, and people would always go, oh my gosh, the best things in, happen in your sister's life. And then she moved in with us and she watched us and she watched how we work. And she said, 
this stuff isn't just happening to you. Yeah. You guys are creating it. So this is the story of Ted. Okay. I set a goal for 2015 to give a TED talk. TED is now in Canada. Most people don't know. Big Ted isn't here anymore. Oh. Yeah, they, they moved to Canada a couple of years ago. And so there are a handful of TEDx's that are here that are basically the biggest ones that are here and there that have production value that's similar. Oh, okay. So I did my research to figure out which ones they were. And then after I did my research and narrowed it down to the one that was the top one, it was in Portland. Okay. So then I went to LinkedIn and looked <laughs> up the person who owns that TEDx. And then I sent an email to someone who was connected to them. <laughs> and, wow. and said, I, I love it. Do you know this person? And she replied almost immediately. And she says, not only do I know him, he just asked me if I had a suggestion for a TED speaker. Awesome. So yeah, curated it. happenstance. It doesn't just so happen. tell me what your sister saw, that work ethic. What's your average day like or your average week like? <laughs> I mean, you already talked about the traveling, which is crazy in itself. Yeah. Right? My, my average week starts, it just depends on what's going on. So this week has been a lot of 4 a.m. Calls. I had an interview with the New York Post that was at like 5 a.m. So I'm up at 4 a.m. And then by 6 a.m. I'm in meetings. And so it just depends. But it can start as early as 4 and it can end as late as 1 a.m. Oh my. It really just depends. But, but, and this is the key, I can work these crazy hours because my husband and I always observe the Sabbath. And by that, I just mean a 24-hour day of rest, oh, no okay. matter what. Shut off the phones, shut off the computer. Everyone hmm. in, in our companies know we are going black for 24 hours. Wow. And we've done that our entire marriage. And so even when we have these long hours, we'll look at each other and go, two more days to the Sabbath, 24 hours to the Sabbath. Yeah. Like we can keep pushing because on that, on that seventh day we will rest. Wow, that's great. Now, you mentioned that you ended up in that general manager position because you didn't want employees anymore. <laughs> So, and do you have employees now? Oh, yeah. Close to 100. 100 employees. Wow. Yeah. Okay. For well, when I say that, it's it's the companies that I am, I oh, am so in, you're so I'm investing. So, yeah. I see. Okay. So. so, you had mentioned that, that you didn't, you know, you were trying to get out of having employees, which makes yeah. me think you know a little bit about what kind of employees you're looking for and what you don't. So, yes. how do you find great talent and what, what, you know, what's your advice for people who are just starting to build a team? Oh, gosh. The, the way that you find great talent is to be great talent and by that I mean I go into every situation wanting to serve that is my style if I am not willing to do your job then I should not be hiring anyone to do your job when I was in hotels I would go down I would bust tables and I would talk to all the guests and I would always have people tell me you do know that you have staff to do this Yes, but my hands work as good as theirs. Mm -hmm. I would spend time in housekeeping, making beds with them so that they understood I don't believe that I am above them. And so it's a little easier to hire for positions when you've at least stepped into the shoes of that position. You know what you're looking for. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so now going back to your number one piece of advice, let's yeah. kind of go through because you're obviously a prolific writer, and I don't know how you have time for that, where you're, where you're writing. But yeah. let's talk about your, let's go with writing first. What's your number one piece of advice for someone who wants to become a New York Times bestseller? Do your homework. Again, curated happenstance. My publisher, I told them, I want to debut at number one on the New York Times. This is my goal. So when they were getting ready to start their marketing plan, putting it together, I said, hold tight you're going to get something in the mail. They got in the mail, I think it was maybe a 22 page marketing plan where I had done the research. This, these are the retailers that report into BookScan. New York Times only pays attention to the books that are shipped, that are reported through BookScan. There, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many things. There's an author who, I mean, she's so close to two million books and, but has never hit the list. And she reached out to me, she has a book coming out next week. And she says, okay, I'm going to try to hit the list. Tell me again what days people need to buy. And I said, number one, <laughs> we would have needed to start working on this yes. about six months ago. Yeah. And number two, it's not when people buy it, it's when it ships. And if people haven't pre-sold books, then the retailers haven't stocked the books, which means they can't actually ship them when it's the week of your release. Wow. And most people don't know this. So there are all these different things. And the crazy part is most publishers don't know this. I was fortunate to be in a publishing house with a VP of sales and marketing who didn't come from publishing. So he was very similar mm -hmm. to me, a numbers person. So I was doing research, he was doing research, and I think 
last year the or the year I came out, I think he had more New York Times bestsellers than wow. any other publishing house that I know of. Man, yeah. what about the writing ethic and, and the work that goes into writing? What's your yeah. advice about that? Everyone is different. So there's a lot of people that say, just show up every day to write. I can't show up every day to write. I was going to say, that how could you possibly? You have, it, you're it, sleeping three hours. It doesn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen. You have to figure out what works for you. And for me, what works is is blocking off a week at a hotel and sitting every morning and just writing. Hmm. That's what works for me. So by the time I leave after day seven, my book is written. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, so now let's talk about your number one piece of advice for aspiring or just starting entrepreneurs. Number one piece of advice for entrepreneurs that are just starting. Be prepared to serve. Man, I love the answers to that question. That's why I ask it every single time. That is an awesome answer. That's great. And what about for companies who are hoping to get the investment from someone like you? What advice do you have for them? Listen. To the, to the investor? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Listen. Awesome. Because there's a reason that we're able to invest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'll right? preach. I love it. I right. love it. Okay. Awesome. Well, I, I mean, I just, my mind is reeling. You've got so much great information today. Thank you so much for letting us come. Thank you. Um, Thank you for coming. Yeah. And congratulations. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm happy to be here. Um, and congratulations on the um, launch of your book Thank and you. your TED Talk and all of your success. And we will be right back after this with a quick game. Here are my key takeaways on achieving success from my interview with Fawn Weaver. Number one, look for a hole. Fawn became the New York Times bestseller we know her as today because she saw a hole in the marketplace and in the media where she was not represented. So if you find a hole in the marketplace where you feel like something is not being represented or a story is not being told, that's your opportunity to tell that story. Number two, do your research. How did she become a New York Times bestseller? How did she land her TED Talk? How did she land press for her books when they came out? She did the research and figured things out herself. I love that she sent a report to her own publishing house on what it took to become a New York Times bestseller because there is a lot that goes into hitting that list. And so she did the research herself and she wrote up a report and sent it to her own publisher. Number three, work hard for what you want. This woman writes New York Times bestsellers. She manages multiple businesses within her portfolio and she leads a community within her Happy Wives Club that is almost one million members. If you find Fawn Weaver, you will find her working. When her sister moved in with her and saw the way that she worked, she realized that things didn't just happen, Fawn made things happen, which I find encouraging because anyone can apply hard work towards their goals. So do the work towards what you want to achieve. And do that work your way, which leads to number four. Because even though many say write every day, Fawn Weaver doesn't. Instead, she holds up in a hotel room and writes her book in one week. And finally, be ready to serve. This was her number one advice for new entrepreneurs or those trying to achieve success. If your goal is to serve your audience, you will find success. All right. Oh, oh, oh. So she was in, oh gosh, the Italian job, the only woman in the crew. Angelina Jolie? No, no, in That's the Italian job. And she was just she in Mad Man. Yes. Jeopardy. Alex Trebek? Yes. Yeah. Now we're rocking. She sings and, oh gosh, she does movies and she sings and, boy, she sings like a jazzy kind of. She always had this perfectly coiffed hair. She's been doing it forever. It always involves a piano. Let's let's toss it. <laughs> Cat in the hat. Dr. Seuss? Yes. Oh, he's a bad mamma jamma. Let's see. He Oh gosh. That I mean this is the way that I know him. Oh, he is in everything. He wears a patch in these Captain America movies. Um Samuel Jackson? Yes. She sings, she was on The Voice, the only woman, the first season. Christina Aguilera? Yes. Ah! Oh, you got a lot. That All was right. good. <laughs> All right, let's see. Where you got five. All right. So I go up, up is to pass. pass. Yeah. Okay. All right. Ooh, he was in the vampire movies that just came out. Oh. Okay, pass. let's pass. <laughs> 
Um, okay. She's funny. She was on 30 Rock. She was... Oh, Tina Fey. No, she's the blonde one. Oh, Amy Powler. No. no. I don't know. Oh, I'm not going to know her name. Yeah. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so-and-so's Rockin' New Year's Eve. Dick Clark? Yeah. Um, oh, she's been in everything. Oh, but she had this big splash in the media when she did this magazine cover, like, with no, hardly anything on. Kim Kardashian? No, she's older, and she had no Photoshop. What else has she been in? Oh, my gosh. She's failing at this. She's older and no f- Yeah. Photoshop. Go past. I'll be able to maybe remember. Okay, um, Baby, You're a Firework. Um... Song singers, and she always wears like candy and stuff. Katy Perry, yes. Um, royal family overseas. Will- William and Catherine. Yeah, you got it. Prince uh. William. Okay, I think man, that was like a tie. <laughs> Which all of my games always crash and burn, so I feel like we. All right, that. yay. Okay, well, not only did you just get a very good game of heads up, of heads up, finally, um, she has generously offered to give away an autographed copy of her book. So enter to win this week. Go to the pursuit.tv slash Fawn Weaver, and then you will be able to enter to win and get all the details. And again, thank you. Thank you. I, uh, it has been just a pleasure to be here. So I'm Kelsey Humphreys, and this is Fawn Weaver, and this has been The Pursuit. <laughs> <laughs>